several other questions from last time. Questions, not not uh, accusations. <laughs> Anything? <coughs> right. I had is there a difference between social constructivists and postmodernists? Is there a difference between social constructivists and postmodernists? <coughs> I mean, is that social constructivist is a true, like in some cases at least. So. <laughs> I think they're largely synonymous. So the great, I mentioned the name earlier. I mean, I, this is kind of getting us back into the, the story of postmodernism and uh, even the stuff with the uh, appearance and what do you want to call it? The, the movement of the LGBTQ kind of ideology into the mainstream such that it, it's become sort of protected. Uh, class, if you will, is, I mean, you could trace its roots, and, and the social constructivism that's part of that view, you could trace its roots if you want. There's certainly lots of individuals, but the guy is a man, a thinker named Michel Foucault, who came from France uh, to U, U, U Cal Berkeley. Um, he was not legally forced to leave France, but because of social pressure had to leave France because he and some other postmodern thinkers in the 1970s had signed these petitions for France to lift um, laws governing age of consent. Meaning he was, I mean, the guy was a, the, the common parlance was a pedo. Like legitimate, verifiable pedophile would go to Tunisia on vacations, and his latest biographies. There's a biography uh, uh, called Saint Michel Foucault. The subtitle. Don't read this unless you're ready to be introduced to a very, very strange and, and offensive world. Uh, the subtitle is like towards a gay hagiography. It's about this. It's written by his former partner or whatever. Um, Foucault came to the United States, taught philosophy and politics and humanities at UCAL Berkeley, wrote a number of books. Some of his books, to be honest, are kind of, they're like from a, if it weren't for the effects of those ideas, they're kind of interesting to read. Uh, he was a hardcore social constructivist in that for him, his whole philosophical program was largely wrapped around defining anything as normal. So he wrote a, a history of the like mental health um, uh, insane asylums. And, and the history of how culture, Western culture, has looked at the issue of mental health. And he is, it's not his only argument. One of his primary arguments, though, is like uh, insane asylums from the 19th and early 20th century were um, a product, an institution, from a culture that didn't have space for people who were what we'd call like neurodivergent today <coughs> or bipolar, you know, any of the other sort of categories. And the insane asylum is like the example par excellence of how normativity marginalizes and oppresses people. Uh, he did that with sexuality and, and other things like that as well. And, why did he do, why did he write, I mean, the, I think his history of the insane asylum, is, or his history of sexuality is like two massive volumes, if I remember correctly. Why does he dedicate so much time to it? Because he's doing the work of deconstruction by exposing what he believes, or he, he believes were the hidden, arbitrary assumptions that Western culture has made about what is, more, what is normal, moral, good, true, beautiful, and, and everything else. And, in exposing its, what he believed was its arbitrary nature, but behind it, he was also exposing the hidden power play behind defining things as, as, as normal. And once you do that, then you can be, begin deconstructing. So this is gonna get a little, I'm gonna try to keep this as PG, or G-rated as possible. Actually, it would be probably PG-13. Um, hit one of his, the, the, the thing intellectually, or his intellectual endeavors towards the end of his life were primarily at advancing uh, the case that, in terms of sexual behavior, uh, any 
something is on on the table, so to speak, such that the way he's described is he's the, he was part of the BDSM movement, you know, like leather whips, chains, that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be familiar with I'm not really, all I know about it is <laughs> just for the record. But uh, that was his, his big thing. And um, it's on film. He, his argument was that while this might look odd, it's not odd to those who are involved in that sort of thing. So therefore, it's normal to those groups. So that, that group can be elevated or somehow find a way to, to advance themselves as sort of an alternative and maybe like a norm to, then our understanding of what counts as normal extends. And that's where you see the kind of cultural Marxism uh, creep in, this desire to change, do philosophy for the sake of changing society. So philosophy, um, I know I, I referred to this already this morning, but in the tradition of Karl Marx and Marxism, Marx famously once said, philosophy is now no longer about understanding the world, discovering, pursuing truth, and all these other noble things, or seemingly noble things from the past. Philosophy is simply using language and ideas to destroy society as we know it so that a new society could emerge, like an equitable type of society where he, this is one of my favorite lines, because I, I like part of it. He says, so that a person, a, a man or a woman, could hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, do some animal husbandry in the early evening, and criticize all night long. <laughs> that's, that's, for Mark, that's the telos of a real free civilization where and he, he sort of assumed that we'll all just sort of like pick up where other people's people leave off and everything will be taken care of um, by somebody else. So back to, I know that's, I'm like opening up a, a can of worms. That, that's not all postmodern thinkers, but the late postmodernists, the ones who are cited time and again, that's what they're after. Um, my brief time at, as an administrator, one of the, we have a PhD program at this place where I was a dean and assistant provost. They had a PhD in leadership, which I don't know what that is, but it's a PhD in leadership. And it, uh, um, we were having issues with these dissertations when they were <coughs> finished. You know, they'd be advertised when the oral defense was going to happen, and that makes it a public thing. Mm -hmm. And so everybody has access to it, and that, that's all well and good. But here you've got an LCMS institution uh, with dissertation titles like Defeating Heteronormativity. Like, <laughs> so like, that was my day, one of the first days on the job. I was like, hey, Adam, you get to read all these dissertations to see how we, what's going on in the class, these PhD classes and so on. One thing I noticed is, I want to say 100%, but I should a uh, uh, high percentage, only because I can't remember every one of them. When it came to, the, so in dissertations, there's always a section on the literature review, like the stuff that the person who's writing the dissertation read in preparation for their research, and a section on methodology. like. How do they proceed in their research? And what assumptions do they have going into their research? And the footnote for their authority and methodology was always Michel Foucault. Uh, and I was like, geez, this is, um, this is wild. I think it's like the most second author of all time. This is the last week. Something to that fact is like the most cited in research papers possibly. It, well, he's not been around. We're only in the, he was a 20, 20th century guy, so. I mean, he's, to be sure, probably in, in social science literature, that probably is the case. I hope, see, I hope the Bible would, you know, but maybe I won't, who knows? <laughs> I think if you're talking about all of literature from the ancient world to the present, but if you're talking like educational theory, social theory, that sort of thing, that would not surprise me. Uh, that's how profound his influence was. And he, in his own personal life, demonstrated purposely that with certain structures in society, for example, at a university where he was, while it looked like there, were, there was a ranking system among faculty just as a way to reward merit, really what was behind the hierarchy of ranking faculty from lecturer to assistant, associate, and full professor 
was a, a way that was that was all done to give some cla a class of person or people uh, power. And what he did after he became aware and was diagnosed with HIV, it showed that his position as full professor could be used to get students to do things they otherwise wouldn't. And something they say at least two dozen of his students died as well with the AIDS that he gave them. So that he's considered like one of these heroes boggles my mind. It's it's like when people cite Frederick Nietzsche, you know, a guy who died from complications related to syphilis, um, and but these are the ones who get put forward as these great. Thought leaders, as they're sometimes called now. Anyway, that was a long answer to a question. <laughs> I'm notorious for doing such things. Um, one thing, uh, when you, one thing about everything we cover this morning is it's a pretty, as we kind of talked a bit about, it gives a pretty, dark, it's a pretty dark picture of things. And I'm also notorious for doing that sort of thing. You should hear me on Islam. <laughs> I know you'd all be buying night vision goggles and AR-15. Wait, well, you know, after my lecture. Not legally, we It is dark, and it's a dangerous, ideologically, philosophically dangerous landscape. I'm guessing most, maybe all of you, are pretty immune to it. Um, I don't know who the oldest person in the room, but probably whoever it is is not really going to read something from Michel Foucault and say, this is it, this is what I've been waiting to read forever. But um, for young people, that's, at least for me as a, as a dad and a, a teacher, um, this stuff is everywhere in, the, in education and elsewhere. Um, and it, I don't think it has a whole lot of persuasive power on its face, but when it's endorsed as sort of like the not just the latest, but like the best explanation of things. That's where things get, get problematic. So what, what to do? Retreat, embrace, or, or stand firm. Uh, there are certainly lots of examples, and we will, even though I've already done it with the United Methodist Church, we will not pick on, um, in name at least, other traditions and how they approach things, but you're probably well aware of the fact that Christian church body denominations or confessions have wrestled with this and have taken different postures. Uh, from There are those who would retreat, think like the extreme would be the Amish. And have you ever heard of Amish Lutherans? I'm just kidding. I mean, there are some. <laughs> there are Amish and, and uh, communities that are sectarian in nature that would just simply separate themselves from it in the realm of higher ed. This is what you at least maybe historically would get in the rationale behind Bible colleges. Now, not that This is not a criticism of Bible. It would be great to go to a college and study just the Bible, but usually the reason why those Bible colleges were established was to provide a, like if you will, to use modern parlance, a safe space where students wouldn't be influenced by the world and, and study the Bible. And I think that would be a really great thing, but it's really hard not to be influenced by the world, especially in the age of social media when the world is coming to your back pocket or wherever you keep your smartphone. I keep it in the back pocket because my glutes need a little massage when it vibrates sometimes. So <laughs> <laughs> That's the most scandalous joke in the world. <laughs> um, there are those who do that. More popular, I think, in the world of general Protestantism uh, is the other extreme, if you will, that is a an embracing of some of this stuff. If it's sometimes it's just a sort of terminological embracing that is using the language for the sake of winning some or not causing um, undue offense or something like that. But more often than not, what you see happen is when the even the languages used, the institutions start to conform to those ideas. Um, I'm not going to mention names, but I, I know somebody quite well who works for a historically evangelical organization that is committed to on-campus evangelism. Um, and uh, I don't know, I think the organization goes back five decades at least. It's not, it's not uh, Campus Crusader or InterVarsity, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> Just, um, but th they've always been solidly um, conservative, not fundamentalist, but conservative evangelical, tended more towards reformed, um, and in the over the last 10 years have moved very quickly into what they call an affirming organization. 
uh, and the justification has been, well, in order to reach those students uh, who might be LGBTQ or who might be left-wing, woke kind of racial uh, sort of activists and things like that, uh, we've got to start, our theology has to be organized around those sorts of concerns. And that's where it started. But uh, now it's basically, it affirms that uh, one of the, the one I heard of most recently as I was talking with this person uh, is that they're trying to figure out how they can separate, distinguish themselves from Christian churches and organizations that would um, dare say that the act of extramarital sexual acts are sinful without getting into to all those details. Um, so they, like in the space of about 10 years, have moved from being a missional evangelical uh, campus ministry to, if you ask me, I don't, I mean, the resurrection of Jesus is sort of like third tier interest to them at this point. Um, and for the sake of just making friends, if you will, they basically become like the world. And this person I know who works for them is kind of struggling with whether or not he should leave. I'm like, uh, duh. <laughs> then there's like in the middle there's Jesus option uh, um, where in, in John 17 Jesus high priestly prayer where he um, prays to the father I and says I've given them your word in this particular speaking specifically to the apostles but by extension the church I would argue I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am out of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, key point, but that you keep them from the evil one, you might add, while they're still in the world. They are not of the world, just as I am out of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Some people are like, I, it's not just Jesus, it's also the Lutheran tradition would would suggest that Christians, regardless of where they find themselves, whether it's in secularist, uh, progressivist is probably a better description, America, or in deep in the heart of the Ottoman Empire, or wherever, um, that is their calling. So we're going to look at some stuff from Luther on... Uh, Christians in the public, or what we're calling the public arena, or we might just say the non, a non-Christian world, maybe even a negative world, and then we'll move to, I think it's one more slide on some real particulars and how to think and navigate that world. <clears throat> First and foremost, interestingly, so Luther is a 16th century guy, right? Dies in 1546. He's at the tail end of the Middle Ages, uh, trained in medieval institutions, the University of Erfurt, an Augustinian friar, um, the people around him, even after his, you know, the beginning of the Reformation, even though he could rant and rave and criticize and maybe we might even add deconstruct those around him for being servants of the Antichrist or, or what have you, he still recognized that he was living in Christendom in some way. In fact, uh, even towards the end of his life, when he's cranky, and for good reason, you know, uh, he can, on one day, it's not that he's speaking out of both sides of the mouth, but he's, he's asserting two truths that um, are, are interesting at the very least. He can, on one day, call the office of the papacy, as he puts it in the, the title of a, a, an essay, an institution of the devil. In another work, you can say, but at least under the papacy throughout the Middle Ages, pure doctrine was maintained. The doctrine of the Trinity, two natures in Christ, and, and so on. So Luther, as much as he's, and rightly so, critiqued the um, shallowness, the errors, and so on of Christ Christianity all around him, and in many ways was kind of a, uh, a leader of a sort of Christianizing of a Europe that had sort of lost its way, um, he is aware of a world that is deeply anti-Christian. Uh, and especially after 1529, he becomes increasingly aware of it. And you can, in Luther's writings, though, 
but when you read or study the history of the Reformation, yeah. most of us, you know, we know the story of the posting the 95 Theses, uh, his, his stand before Charles V, maybe the Augsburg Confession, but then it kind of trickles out a little bit, unless you're like a, a serious Reformation wonk, then you're gonna probably go all the way up to 1580, maybe. Um, there is a side to the Reformation that is oftentimes, it's not that it's, uh, well, it's missed, not because it's not interesting, but just because it's not part of that, the larger Reformation story. And that's the side of where two worlds start colliding in the Reformation. It begins in um, you know, the early, well, in 1453, even before Luther is born, when the Ottoman Turks, this Muslim, Sunni Muslim kingdom becomes an empire uh, with the sack of Constantinople in May of 1453. And the Hagia Sophia, this church that was at that point about 1,200 years old and the largest church that had been built to that date is that very day converted into a mosque. And the Sultan uh, slowly but surely will become or earn the title or take on the title of Caliph. And from 1453, subsequent decades, the Ottoman Empire begins to conquer other Islamic lands, incorporate other Islamic lands into its domain, but begins pushing northwards into Europe, mostly following the Danube River Basin. And at the, not the end of the Danube River Basin, but close to the end, deep into Europe, is the city of Vienna. It's also the eastern capital of the Habsburg Empire of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, which was neither holy nor Roman, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and the, the idea was the Ottomans thought that if they could take Vienna, that would put them at the, not just the eastern, but in a sense kind of the northern capital of the this Holy Roman Empire, from which Going along North Africa, which they started to take territory, they'd make their way back into Spain. They'd been removed from Spain in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. They thought they could go back into Spain and begin at taking the rest of Europe as sort of like, like a pincher, like a crab pincher. So they, they, 1526, this is just a, what, five years after Luther makes his stand at Worms. They're in, the, in central Hungary. Uh, they kill King Louis there and convert the Matias Templum, the, the great cathedral in Buda or Pest, they're on two sides of the river, I forget which one is which, but, uh, uh, and convert that to a mosque. Uh, Luther hears of it and writes some uh, consolation on the Psalms and expresses uh, that he had been asked about how to deal with the Ottoman Turks for a couple of years at that point and he refused to answer. Uh, because he thought everybody in Europe was itching for a crusade. In fact, the popes at the time, Leo X, had, had issued calls for a renewed crusade uh, against the Ottoman Turks, and Luther finally said, Christians have no business being involved in a crusade. Christians have every right and an obligation to defend their neighbor. So if the Turks do come within proximity of German lands, Germans had the obligation to take up arms and to slaughter every Turk that they could find, so long as it's in defense of their German neighbors. But, and he goes on and he says, but if you're going outside of your, your own lands, and you're fighting against the Ottoman Turks, and you see, he says, if you see a bishop with a flag with a crucifix on it, you should run from it as if it's the devil, which is kind of an odd thing. Um, then, three years later, 1529, the Turks make their way up to Vienna. And Luther, he doesn't change his tune, but his focus becomes a little different. He all of a sudden becomes aware of, as I mentioned a little earlier this morning, that there is a world that Christians are being taken into. Because while the Ottoman Turks were notorious for slaughtering whole vi villages, uh, they would take some, they would take young men, they would take young women, and bring them back to Turk or uh, Istanbul or elsewhere and sell them in slave markets uh, for all sorts of purposes. So Luther hears about that, but he also knows full well that the Ottoman Empire is advancing. The borders of what, what Muslims would call the domain of Islam is advancing. He knows full well as the borders of Islam are advancing, though he hasn't read the Quran at this point yet. Uh, he's studied Turkish history, he's studied a little bit of Islamic history. He knows Islam is primarily a legal religion, 
primarily interested in transforming institutions and the laws that uphold them, not so interested in individuals' particular faiths. So he knows if Christians get stuck in this region, all of a sudden the laws of the land are going to change. And they're going to find that it's increasingly difficult to publicly uh, confess or witness to the Christian faith. He says, in fact, as he writes this work here to the right, a, a muster sermon or an army sermon against the Turk, that if you find yourself living under the domain of the Turks, you need to realize that you are probably not going to have an evangelical preacher, a preacher of the gospel at your disposal. There won't be churches, most likely. You're not going to have access to Christian books. Uh, in fact, if you wear a crucifix or even make the sign of the cross before you pray, uh, you might find yourself with your head on a chopping block. <clears throat> she says, in order to provide my dear German Christian some aid, I'm writing this sermon. We'll get to that sermon in just a bit. But he's, he's increasingly aware of this non-Christian world that's moving into Christendom. <clears throat> In uh, 1535, when he's lecturing on Galatians, there's this, I think it's a juicy quote. I don't know what a juicy quote is, but I like the quote. <laughs> uh, he even expresses, which is kind of interesting, if, you know, reading the later Lutheran, he's interested in, in lots of things, but he's still very much about uh, articulating the doctrine, doctrine of justification by grace through faith on account of Christ alone, over and against Catholic objections and... Um, Anabaptist and, and other sorts of Christian objections, Christian objections. Um, but he's also aware of this non-Christian world that Christians might find themselves in. So he's in his lectures on Galatians. He says, when you're in the context, he's, he's it's the very beginning of his lectures. He's telling he's telling his students that when we're doing theology, uh, our formal source of authority, our own and final source are the scriptures. Church tradition is helpful to be sure, but if church tradition or the teachings of the papacy or the teachings of a theologian uh, fly in the face of the clear teachings of the scriptures, they are to be disregarded. However, when you leave the, when he says, when you leave the doctrine of justification, that is when you're doing, if you will, like theology, when you're speaking about religion, apart from real or Christian theology, when you have to engage in controversy, when you have to, when you're speaking with Jews, Turks, or other sectarians, and when Luther uses the word sectarian, he's not talking about different Christian confessions. He's talking about uh, the other world religions. He's not totally aware of what other ones are out there, but he's heard, of, he's not in name, but he's heard about what we would call Buddhism and Hinduism today. He's heard of Zoroastrianism. Those are the sect other sectarians and so on. When you hear about these things and you're talking about even the power, wisdom, and so on of God, then you must use all your cleverness and effort and be as profound and subtle as a controversialist as possible. For then you are in another area. There's, there's a space uh, where you're living and talking as a Christian uh, that's different than talking and living as a Christian in the church. It's not like they're in two totally different compartments and the standards all, all change. But there is this other area where a Christian needs to use different, different, if you will, tactics, a different disposition, take on a different disposition in talking about uh, uh, theology, if you want. And we start to see him develop this in his, this, this says 1542 was originally written in 1529 in this work, an army sermon against the Turk. In that work, he says, so I've got, he, he starts the work by interpreting the times. And he interprets, it. I think I mentioned this morning, that the Ottoman Turks were predicted in scripture in Daniel chapter seven. That's about half of the work. Then the whole second half is his advice on how Christians should think about and what they should know um, possibly going to live under Islamic law. The first thing he says is because you won't have a preacher, there won't be churches, there probably won't be books for you to read, you need to, he says, learn the Christian faith now. 
and he lists the things that you should you should especially be intimately familiar with. Anybody want to guess what they might be? Lord's Prayer, Prayer, Ten Commandments, and the Creed. 1529 is also the same year he's writing the Catechism. He did learn the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and he says, and especially this article of the Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ. So, excuse me, so on. Um, why that? The answer to us is probably obvious, but as he puts it where he goes, this is the, the one article of doctrine, one religious teaching or theological teaching that separates us and distinguishes us from all other religions on earth. This is the thing that makes Christians Christians. That's probably not like, it's not like we've discovered gold here. Then, he says, you need to maintain your faith while you're there. How do you do that? If there aren't churches and there aren't other Christians for you to have fellowship with, you need to learn to do it on your own. Uh, as, as great as it would be to have a congregation, you might not have that, he says. So you need to do your own. This is not the, the words he used, but you need to do your own, have your own, uh, what we might call devotions or your own practices of worship. He says, because making the sign of the cross or some other traditional Christian posture might draw undue attention to you, figure out other ways to, to practice your devotion without drawing attention to yourself. And he says, I and mean, this is a minor point, but it's, I think kind of interesting, he says, instead of making the sign of the cross, every time you pray, just press your thumb to your forefinger. And that will replace the sign of the cross for you. And it'll, you know, he doesn't say it this way, but it effectively will buy you more time. Secondly, he says, you also need to come to terms with the fact that if you're under the Ottoman Turks, uh, you need to know that that's what God had planned for you. And I'm not, like I said earlier, I'm not sure I really can go full on with Luther on this because it's not advice I'd give to my daughters. Um, but he says, if you're under the Ottoman Turks, that's where God has placed you. Do not try to run from them. Uh, others, he says, count, have counseled trying to flee uh, some have even counseled suicide uh, because you run the risk living under Islam of converting to Islam either forcibly or, or by your own, your own will. So better to end it immediately. He says, don't do any of those things. Just come to terms with the fact that sometimes God puts Christians or allows Christians to be in places where things are very uncomfortable. Then he gives all sorts of examples from Scripture, uh, like the Babylonian captivity. <clears throat> Third thing, you need, be, need to be aware of your context. You need to know a little bit about the, te the religion of the Turks, as he called it. He never used the term Islam. It wasn't a term non-Muslims used until like the 19th century. You need to be aware of the, Tur the religion of the Turks or the Saracens is another term he'll use. It's a medieval term for, for Muslim. Uh, you need to know that while they will talk about Jesus, and they will talk about Jesus in very laudable terms. If you've read the Quran, um, you know, a case could be made, though I would be very quick to argue to the contrary, that Jesus is held in, in a place of honor according to Islamic tradition. The problem is it's not the real Jesus, but that's neither here nor there, I guess. Um, so you need to know about your context and what the Turks teach about religion. You need to especially know what they teach about Jesus. Uh, so that you're not confused, or we might say the word, use the word duped, into thinking that their religion and your religion are the same, even though they might praise Christ. So know that while Muslim, uh, the Turkish people might, from their Quran, say that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, the Quran says that, that he performed miracles, that he was the Messiah, know that even that language is not... Uh, reconcilable with Christian, the Christian understanding of Jesus. Why, he says, because ultimately when it comes down to it, Islam denies the very essential thing about Jesus, that denies that he died on a cross and rose from the dead, which is a, a teaching in the Quran. Um, you also need to be aware of that you're gonna be persecuted. He says, he gives this specific, and I won't get into details because I don't really like talking about, but the, he gives specific advice to females, he says, 
there's going to be some awful things that happen to you. And you can probably imagine what that might be. Uh, he says, know that that's not your fault, uh, that that's what the Turks do, but even though that's happening to you, you still, like anybody else who's caught under the Turks, and this, you know that God has that for you. Not that particular thing, but he has your place, station, your servitude under the Turks for you, and you need to learn how to serve your Turkish master the way you would serve any other master, regardless whether they're Christian, Muslim, or anything else. And then he goes on and says, and then in doing so, in serving the Turks well, be careful not to serve the Ottoman Islamic regime. Do not, if you're required, if you're given a weapon and, and told to march and, and fight against Christians, drop your weapon, and if they kill you, they kill you. You cannot serve the Ottoman Islamic regime, but what you must do is serve the person who has purchased you. And this is in American culture these days. This is not exactly the stuff you really want to talk about, but he says there are plenty of examples in Scripture uh, where um, the, the uh, New Old and New Testament authors uh, encourage servants and even slaves to serve their masters faithfully. Then he goes on and says, and in doing so, you might find the occasion, if you serve your masters faithfully, uh, that they'll start to see you as different. They'll start to recognize that, contrary to what we've been taught, those German Christians are a bunch of sissies, rather they're loyal, faithful subjects. And then, all of a sudden, he doesn't say it exactly this way. All of a sudden, though, your Turkish master might start asking you why. Why it is you don't try to run, or why it is you don't grumble about your work, why it is you're not being subversive, subversive in that master of state or whatever, and then you might have an opportunity to speak the gospel to them. And that, like I said earlier this morning, I don't know what I think about all that advice, there's a reason why I forced my daughters not to do ballet and learn jujitsu, right? And I take them to the gun range and things like that. But uh, uh, but this is Luther, and at least you get the spirit. The spirit makes sense. Um, but this is remarkable stuff from Luther. Now the, the thing with this this work is it's been translated into English, just not been published. In fact, CPH says they're going to wait maybe five to ten years to publish it for whatever reason. But. Uh, um, it's fascinating advice from a guy living in the 16th century. What I find, and this probably won't, be, won't surprise you if you know anything about me, and I'm not trying to confirm my bias, but towards the end, Luther says, and in speaking the gospel to that, your Turkish master, you need to learn how to defend it. You need to learn what Peter meant when he says, always be prepared to give a reason for those who would ask you for a reason for the hope within you. Sorry, which of that? Uh, and then he says, I don't know enough about Islam yet to offer a robust defense of the Christian faith. Uh, but when I get my hands on the Quran, I'll certainly provide it. And that eventually, uh, about 10 years later, so late 1530s, Luther gets a copy, a Latin translation of the Quran, reads it, and then begins working on a German translation of an old legal polemic against Islam that he instructed his publisher to publish in a small format so that German soldiers going off to fight the Turks could stick it in their pocket. And in camp or in, in uh, garrison or whatever, they could read it so that if they're caught and taken as a prisoner of war, they would know how, know how to address Islam. Uh, not just in terms of pro uh, speaking the gospel to them, but they'd also be able to address the objections Muslims would have uh, to the Christian faith. Now, this isn't a seminar on Lutheran Islam. Uh, it illustrates, though, a thing, a, um, a tradition in the Lutheran world that is oftentimes glossed over, at least I think, and that is the tradition of um, Christian engaging in Christian apologetics uh, or just generally using our reason and our senses uh, to engage the, you know, the public arena um, in a world that does not share our, the same presuppositions or assumptions we, we, we have. Before we get there, I want to pause if there are, see if there are any questions. We've been done about 50 minutes. So, Luther probably drew a parallel between 
surfing and not treatment theory. There's a lot of opinion like Old Testament parallels when um, Daniel and then yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Daniel and uh, <clears throat> Joseph and in fact in the Muster Sermon he says this is the way God's saints have always dealt with persecution. They have submitted to their their masters and worked, put their head down, worked hard and looked for opportunities to, to speak wisdom and ultimately to speak the gospel. I mean, I'm paraphrasing Luther's words here, you know, putting a modern twist on them, but uh, absolutely. So, so he didn't object to people coming under Turkish rule or not trying to flee it? Like, would he be averse to people trying to flee before the Turks would arrive? No. Uh, in fact, not, I don't want to get into, unless you all want to, but uh, um, he says, don't. Like, in fact, he, in his, uh, the visitation, so when the, the small catechisms are written, or the small and the large catechism are, writ are written, it's after he and Melanchthon and others had sort of visited the churches that were under the influence of, of Luther's, or the, the Lutheran Reformation, and they find that the churches are just in an abysmal state in terms of the Christian education of the catechesis, so that's why they re uh, write the catechisms. But before that, they basically, Melanchthon was the primary author, but Melanchthon and Luther write a report for the prince to, to describe the state of affairs in the ch churches in, in Saxony. And um, one, of the, one of the articles, I don't remember which one, talks about how a lot of churches are teaching a type of pacifism under the influence of the Anabaptist, the Radical Reformation notion that Christians cannot take up a sword, they cannot uh, serve in public uh, in political positions. And as they they taught that we need to rectify this. And so Luther goes on and says, in one place, he says that if the Turks move into our region, every Christian is obligated, including women, if it comes to that, to take up arms and to resist the Turks at all costs. <clears throat> and if you're going to lose your village, but you can still run, he says, set it afire. We don't want to give any aid to the Turks. And so he advocates like a scorched earth, uh, earth policy. But then, so Luther can talk that way, and then he can give advice to those who are um, going to be stuck in the Ottoman Empire, a subject of the Turk. He can elsewhere say, and this is not that Luther's contradictory or anything like that, but he, you know, we've got so much stuff from his long, li relatively long life that you know, there's bound to be things that don't seem to square. One place he says, I wish I was a younger man so I could go speak the gospel to the Sultan, like go be a, a missionary to the, the head of the Muslim world. And then else, in 1530, he gets wind that the Sultan has been um, using spies that have been reporting on Luther. There's a, uh, in 1530, there's an old spy report from in, using Arabic script and the Turkish language about Martin Luther. Oh, wow. That says if we can get access to this guy, because he's like the chief enemy of the Pope, and we can convince this guy to persuade the Germans, the northern Germany, Germans, uh, to come on our side, I don't know why they would do that, but uh, uh, we be able to do that easily. So Luther gets wind of uh, there's an ambassador who comes to Luther's table. It's in it's in the table talk of Luther. Says that the the, the Sultan has promised you safe passage and that he will be a gracious lord to you Luther, if you just throw in on the, the Turkish side. And Luther says, uh, God help me protect me from this gracious Lord who makes the sign of the cross. So like, he says he wants to go do it, but then he's not going to do it because, and, but really though, his, his life probably would have, oddly enough, at that point he was an outlaw and a heretic. He just was lucky to have a prince who watched over him, right? Um, he probably would have had a little more freedom, oddly enough, under the Ottoman you know, Sultan. Interesting. A question, were there any major Christian enclaves in the Ottoman Empire before yes. it fell? Yeah, oh yeah, lots of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the Orthodox Church stood, st not strong, but stood and was was granted um, protected status. Under under the traditional laws of Islam, Christians and Jews, and maybe Zoroastrians, some say, Muslims debate about this, but if, as long as you pay a poll tax, like an additional tax apart from all the other taxes, you can buy your relative liberty, but you cannot publicly display the Christian faith at all. Like you can't wear crucifixes, churches can't ring bells, uh, anything that would, would mark a Christian presence in a Muslim majority land is, is outlawed. And if you're caught, 
like the story, I'm going to go into the weeds just a little bit, like the, the guy I studied with under Oxford, he translated a old fatwa from the Middle Ages on the question of whether Christian monks could live in Muslim-majority lands. And uh, the, um, the uh, answer was, they can so long as they do not display the Christian faith or witness to the Christian faith, and certainly as long as they do not proselytize the Muslims in that region. Uh, that translation, uh, if, if, and if they are, or, sorry, that thought was says, but if they are found to be proselytizing in any way, like singing too loudly, such that Muslims hear, or something like that, uh, they should be forcibly removed, and if they resist, executed. So, um, I think it's Of Gods and Men, there's a Netflix, or what, I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but it's an old French language movie, uh, about the beheading of seven Trappist monks in Algeria that used that fatwa that Yahya translated into French as justification for killing those, uh, those monks. But they would, and the, the argument was, by going to the market wearing their monastic habits was, was bearing witness to the Christian faith. So, uh, but if you, if you, like the history of, of Islam in Muslim majority countries, there's always pockets of Christians uh, and at least historically, when there's been real Islamic law in place, it's it's always come at a cost to their liberty. But there's always been this sort of status quo. Uh, the city of Mosul, if you remember the ISIS, Mosul, Iraq, for since the Islamic conquest, since the seventh century, was a Christian city in Iraq for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it wasn't until what twenty. 16 or something like that when it ceased to be a, a Christian country. So, yeah, that was the tangent, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's talk about, let me go back real quick to this. When it comes to dealing with a uh, society or a culture that's uh, hostile, uh, at least indifferent, if not hostile, uh, poses challenges to Christianity, at least in, in Carl Truman's book, his advice, and I think it's really good advice, the one thing Christians are called and must do, must not give up, is publicly witnessing to the faith by their basic confession. And that doesn't mean standing on the street corner with a megaphone, but it means maintaining worship. Uh, and for Truman, I think we probably all find this... Um, solid advice, is maintaining historic worship, not just for the sake of preserving a tradition, but because that historic worship, because uh, it's been around so long, all the irrelevancies and all the fads have fade away from that stuff. So historic liturgy, historic church is going to maintain orthodox, small old orthodox historic Christianity as well as teaching within the church as a solid catechesis. I think in our context, we do a, I mean, I'm sure there's probably opinions to the contrary, but generally speaking, in our denomination, and there are others too, um, we do a pretty good job of that, I think. <coughs> Even the most grumpiest confessional Lutheran would say, do a pretty, by comparison, you know, spend much time around evangelicals, you'd be like, huh. We're all right. <laughs> we're all weird, but uh, we're biblically illiterate, but we know our theology. <laughs> Sorry. Where we're historically kind of weak, or at least I would, I think, I would argue, is in our thinking about how we might uh, make a case for Christianity or respond to objections to Christianity in the realm of. of uh, our use of reason, natural reason, natural law reasoning in the public arena. Uh, and at least for me, my interest is in, in the, the task of Christian apologetics. Uh, what I find interesting with this is um, over the years as I've done presentations on these topics, natural theology, natural law, and, and apologetics, is encountering a lot of resistance to it. Like, this isn't a Lutheran thing. Why would you even suggest we should do this sort of thing? And I I want to, like I did earlier, say all contraire. Uh, there actually, in the Lutheran tradition, is a solid history all the way back to, to Luther 
uh, that would use these tools, but only when they're appropriate. It's not like you're going to lean in with a natural theology in every arena, but uh, when, when the, the context is appropriate. And we have scriptural, not just warrant, but an exhortation from scripture to do such things. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15 would be the primary verse that, uh, um, it, uh, that we, Christians are to, and not just clergy, but all Christians, as they're scattered across a culture by God's design, uh, to honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense. And the Greek word behind make a defense is apologion in that passage, uh, from apologia, from which we get the term Christian apologetics. Uh, so always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for, ooh, I can type that right, ask you for a reason for the hope that is in you, and one thing we all we have to add, and I've got colleagues, I'm probably guilty of it as well, we oftentimes forget this last bit, to do it with gentleness and respect. In fact, sometimes that last clause, do it with gentleness and respect, is moved to verse 16. Interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure why that is. I'm sure it's just an editorial decision by Bible translators. Um, it's not just 1 Peter 3, but there are other passages as well, but this is the classic position, or the classic place in scripture that would uh, exhort Christians to such a thing. So let's talk about what uh, Christian apologetics is briefly uh, before we get into some of the apologetic, major apologetic themes or fronts in, in secular culture. Uh, anybody studied Christian apologetics here besides pastors who went to seminary? Okay, so a little bit here. I'm always, a, I teach a, a homeschool co-op on Fridays. And I'm, this year, last year I had to do economics. I know nothing about economics. I, can, I mean, I have, I'm so dumb I have like a Bitcoin account. Um, that's how poorly I understand economics. It's like gambling, you know. That my, my checkbook is like gambling. I'm like, oh, I should buy this. Maybe it'll be worth something someday. So I got guns and bows and arrows and things that will never sell. But I think someday they'll be worth something. But um, this year I'm teaching Christian apologetics. In my first class, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a homeschool co-op filled with evangelicals of every stripe. And um, ages, this year it's 12 to 18. And just passing out the syllabus, going through what we're going to cover, got to a section where I asked them, do you guys have any questions about this? And um, holy cats, I was amazed at the, the answer of some of these 13 and 14 year olds, or, or questions these 13, 14 year olds had. Not about the Christian faith, but like these really informed questions about how do we respond to people who would say that there's thousands of variants in New Testament manuscripts. And this is a 13 or 14 year old. Um, in the, uh, it's not that way usually in, when I'm in Lutheran context, for, for whatever reason. I've got my suspicions, but I won't voice them. Um, but Christian apologetics is roughly, you know, we oftentimes define it as the defense of the Christian faith. I think it's important, though, to go back to the biblical warrant for it that suggests that it's a response after somebody's asked for a reason for the hope within you. It's not leaning in with apologetics. Some of you are maybe familiar with like Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, or what was the little, More Than a Carpenter from way back when, or Lee Strobel's Case for Christ. These are all great books to have on the shelf and maybe even to look at sometimes. Um, but they tend to approach apologetics as if it's the first thing Christians should do in a non-Christian arena. The, the, the way the scriptures speak of apologetics or define the, the uh, task is it's always a response to a particular objection or question somebody has. So it's always an occasional thing. And that's probably why Lutherans aren't like specialists in apologetics typically. Because uh, it, it's, it's an occasional thing. Uh, it's not a, contrary to the way people like me and my teachers in apologetics might give off the vibe that it's should be done always and everywhere. It's always in response to something, not something that you just uh, jump in with guns of blazing. Uh, question? Look, I think we have one question. Oh, sorry. Thank you. There. Just a comment to recommend that because I agree, as Lutherans, we typically 
we're more than happy to acquiesce away from apologetics. But I think the key phrase in there is the part about always being prepared. So I think that's where we can do a lot more work. Yeah, it's, and it's not, I think the, I mean, that's, that's across the board. It's not easy, right? And who wants to, I mean, you start getting into it, like, oh, I didn't even know about this. So you think of, um, was it Mark chapter two? Something that I was studying recently, there's a there's that passage where there's a paralytic box of Jesus, and Jesus took compassion on him and healed him. Oh, it's a leper. Took pat, compassion on him and healed him. And then you look at the NIV, it's like Jesus was angry and then healed him. And then you realize, oh, it's translated differently, not because they translate the same word differently, but rather there's a manuscript or two, a manuscript tradition that has a different verb there. And you're like, wait a minute. There are all these things that you, you pop open, I think it's, well, the Pew Bibles, the Pew Lutheran, you know, the maroon Bibles that are typically in the pews and churches. If you go to the New Testament, that's the study Bible, of course. Oh. But even the Pew Bible will have tons of footnotes, especially in the New Testament, that will say things like, some manuscripts don't omit this, or or like the ending of Mark. I think that's more yeah. Some of the earliest manuscripts don't contain verses 9 through 16. Um, and it gets a little uncomfortable. So you, you, in the Missouri Synod, you're raised with a very high view of Scripture. You know, they're inspired, they're, and they're inerrant, and yet you've got all this stuff. And it's a little uncomfortable. Um, try being in front of people talking about it. Um, <laughs> So my question is, are we preparing for a compassionate response, or are we preparing for battle? Yes. Both. <laughs> it's a, so apologetics, so let me say this, we, and we're going to take a break. I take it as a basic common sense in dealing with non-Christians especially. One should be kind. I don't always practice this, but one should be kind <laughs> and have compassion. I think C.S. Lewis's um, uh, sermon, um, it's called The Weight of Glory, has this profound chunk at the very end. I try to keep it in my head when I'm dealing with, when I'm among non Christians, which is most of the time, um, that there are two miracles you will always encounter in your life as a Christian. One is what happens at the altar on every Sunday morning when the Lord's Supper is being consecrated and distributed, right? That's one miracle. The other miracle is the person right next to you. You've never met a mere mortal, he says. All people will live for eternity. And when you start looking at the other like that, that again, I'm terrible at this stuff. But it'll change you. and It'll change your posture uh, towards others, whether they're queer, trans, or Muslim, or, or whatever. Um, there's as, at the risk of sounding cliche, I mean, their eternal soul is at stake, and you do not want to damage that by just being, a, in my case, a jerk. So I think the, there's a certain politeness in apologetics, but there are real apologetic issues that are um, almost, they can be, it's not combative in the sense of hot and but there are like, like real serious discussions where there's a right answer and a wrong answer. So it's, it's, it's just all context is going to tell you how you navigate that. You know, if you're dealing with a Richard Dawkins who says something <laughs> absolutely stupid, like, we don't have any good reason that Jesus existed in the first place, you know, that's not the time to say, well, let's sit down and talk about it. That's the time to say, you might be a professor at Oxford University, but that was a real idiotic thing to say. Yeah. So, anyway, let's take a break. Quick, quick note. I think the older you get, the Lutherans, this isn't about the guy that bumps into you. This tends to be your family. You know, yeah. For sure. Your kids, your grandkids, your kids, and you know, all that. You know. I'll tell you about my uh, once, he's not an atheist anymore. He thought he was an atheist. But he was also a young earth atheist uh, son. Yeah. Oh, so we'll, we'll, we'll take a break first. It's 207. Let's try to come back 215. He came back. Come back. He came back.